To be broke is economic. To be poor is a disabling frame of mind and a depressed condition of your spirit. And you must vow to never be poor again. You're listening to Philly Who, the podcast that tells the stories of the doers, thinkers, and performers of Philadelphia. My name is Kevin Schmidlin, and today I'm talking with Nasir Smith. Nasir is the CEO and founder of the People's Innovation Movement, a nonprofit that provides free financial literacy classes to Philadelphians. Nasir also founded Philly Financial Literacy Week, which recently received a resolution from city council, making it an official annual city event. Nasir got his start in finance by walking into a bank when he was 18 and just asking for a job. He worked his way up to being a credit analyst, and when he saw the data on Philly credit scores, he was taken aback. Wow. Why are so many minority and low-income communities struggling with their credit? What is the issue? So he came up with a plan to educate the masses about credit and empower them financially, and he pitched it to his bosses. They said no, wasn't profitable for them. I said, wow, you know my values don't line up with this organization anymore, I, I, I gotta go. In this episode, you'll hear the ups and downs of how Nasir created this nonprofit organization from scratch, and how he's made a huge impact on the city before even graduating college. Because literally, if I teach one person in every household in the city, they can teach the rest of their household, and then we can change this epidemic as a whole. All this and more about Nasir Smith, the people's innovation movement, and how they're changing lives one class at a time, now now on Philly Who. Stay tuned. By the time he was 22, Nasir Smith already had four years experience working in financial services. He's worked at TD Bank, Bank of America, and the Police and Fire Federal Credit Union in a variety of roles. But what really impresses me is that while he is currently pursuing a degree in finance from Penn State, he learned a lot of what he knows about money and finance on the job and through just taking new opportunities as they arose. Today, his main gig is spreading that knowledge via the People's Innovation Movement and Philly Financial Literacy Week, both of which he invented. He's the one who can help anybody create and grow wealth regardless of how much they already have. And this ability stems from a lesson that he learned when he was only nine years old from a business owner near his childhood home at 21st and Susquehanna. I went into his coffee shop every day and there was a guy there who who was the owner of the shop. And every day that I would come, he, he would give me a dollar. He would say, I need you to make this dollar work for you. And I never understood that. I, I you know, oftentimes I would take the dollar and go right to the go right to the store because I'm, I'm a year kid I don't know I'm just <laughs> getting a dollar bill right. right I want some candy you know some snacks um, and I kept spending it and then um, it was in the middle of the year one time and he was like so um, at this time he had to been giving out the dollar to me for about ooh, about about six months now and he, he said so how much money do you have and I was like I looked at him like what it would it look like oh my god was I supposed to save the money and I was like, I don't have any money. I was dependent on the dollar you were going to give to me today. I mean, literally, every day before school, I would stop there to get a dollar. Um, and he said, well, I told you to use that dollar to create some other streams of income for yourself. He said, make this dollar work for you. And, that, and that's what it meant. And um, I kind of didn't know exactly what he was referring to as make this dollar work for me. And he later explained that the dollar was an example to show me, you know, that someone made, someone was willing to invest in me to create a water ice stand or maybe some, some type of entrepreneurial way to create money for myself. And I hadn't gotten that lesson at an early age. Um, and right then and there, as I, you know, they say hindsight is 20, uh, 2020. So looking back at it, it was actually a paramount moment for me because it, it showed me that um, no matter where you are in life, you need to allow your money to work for you and you to not work for the money. Even if you're just getting a dollar a day. Even if you're just getting a dollar a day. I mean, it, it you, you have no idea of what one dollar to an eight-year-old kid could do for them if they if you train their mindset towards that right now. So, so is it after that that you decided to study finance or go into banking? 
I mean, I was eight at the time, so I honestly didn't. I, I had aspirations to be a, a, a SEPTA bus driver. Oh yeah, I had every bus schedule in the in in the city, um, and and I had aspirations to be a bus driver. I didn't think about getting into the financial industries until I was about eighteen. So ten years later, yeah, I'm, I'm banking at TD Bank, and I walked in one day, and I was like, I just felt that I was like, I need to be here. So I walked up to one of the bankers, and I said, How do you how do you apply for a job like this? Um, and he said, oh, just go online and apply and I'll get you hired. And I'm like, you're going to get me hired in the bank? <laughs> I said, holy smokes. So I said, okay, cool. Um, at that moment, I went right home. I made it my agenda. I'm like, I'm doing this application. I didn't have a resume at the time. I'm, you know, I, didn't, I never had a job. So I'm, I'm, I was lost. I'm like, oh, I don't have a resume. How am I going to submit this? So I just put uh, not applicable in all of the all of the spots that didn't apply to me <laughs> literally it was like how is this going to get me this job i was nervous <laughs> just put a name <laughs> just put a name just just put anything um and lo and behold a week later i get a phone call i'm sorry an email first from one of the bank recruiters you know um telling me you know hey this is uh uh i, I forget her name she's calling from td bank and you know she wanted to interview me and i was like really so I was like, okay, cool. When do you want me to come? I can come tomorrow. She was like, oh, no, you know, not tomorrow. We're going to set up for later on in the week. I was like, okay, cool. What day? What day? I was excited. Um, so getting into the story, I, I got hired at TD Bank. And when I got hired there, I had a new profound respect for seeing um, how the economy worked on the, on the other side. Yeah. How, you know, how, what kind of things did you see? Being in a, in, in a space where... I was around leaders who were really good stewards of their money. I was around um, customers that came in who, who, from looking at a screen, had had a lot of money. Um, and every time I would see that, I, I don't. It wasn't required of me of my job, but I, I asked questions. I'm like, well, how did you get this amount of wealth? Like, what, what, a, what did you do to amass this, you know, amount of money? And they, and they would tell me, you know, I worked hard. And I'm like, that's a very general response. I right. mean, I'm working hard now at the bank yeah, doing yeah. your transaction <laughs> yeah. as a teller. So I think from there, I, I, I kept asking questions. I didn't let it down. Like I, I, every person came in, I had a notebook. I was, I was writing down questions as to how they got wealth. And the, and the lady came in and she, she gave me four principles that I teach still to this day when I'm doing financial literacy lessons. And, and she said, mindset, which was number one, right? Because she said, if I gave you a million dollars today, would you know how to build wealth with it? Or would you go broke in three months? Um, and the second thing was money, but as the tool. Money is the tool that gets you into financial freedom. It isn't the reason, but it's the tool that you utilize to get there, right? Um, and then she told me time. You know, time is of the essence. We're all, all on borrowed time here. And, and you know, um, to really uh, utilize my time effectively while building wealth and understanding that it's not going to happen overnight unless you're somebody that just won that Powerball for <laughs> the one point three billion, billion yeah. <laughs> that, whatever billion dollars. It's insane. But um, unless you're that person, you're not going to get rich overnight. And then the uh, fourth thing was um, this my surroundings, right? If you hang with five broke people, you'll be the sixth broke person. So I knew I needed to put myself in rooms or with in individuals um, that that had the mindset and that had that were utilizing their money as the tool to drive them towards a financial success in their lives. So I. I wanted to just be in any room at that time with managers, bank executives, any type of opportunity I got to be in that room with them just to hear the conversation and dialogue was um, was next step for me. Because at that time, I still didn't know what money was because I didn't have the mindset. You know, it was two weeks before Christmas um, in 2013 that she told me those principles. And then on Christmas, I asked for all cash. I, I told after that day, I went home. I said, I, I don't, I don't want any gifts. Just give me cash. I don't care if you give me ten dollars or fifteen. I didn't care because I wanted to get the money right and go. And going back toward to when I was eight, I wanted to now allow this money to work for me. Wow. So then, how long did you stay at that bank? So I stayed at TD Bank um, about a year and a half. Right. I was a, I was a sponge. Coming from a background of not having wealth and, and being surrounded with people and other um, like-minded individuals that were trying to ascend as, as I was, and then to have leaders who were willing to you know, teach was uh, astonishing for me. But um, I stayed there for a year and a half. Uh, my manager at the time ended up leaving, and she called me um, on my personal number, and I was kind of shocked. I'm like, oh, she's calling my phone. I got to answer this. Yeah, you know, yeah. At this time, I'm like, at that time, I felt like an opportunist because I was just looking for my opportunity to succeed, to succeed right? Um, and then she said, you know, 
I'm going to uh, Bank of America. What do you think about coming to Bank of America to be a credit analyst? And I said, credit analyst? I said, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> yes, but what's that? Yeah, what's that? Like, yeah, I'll come. What's that? So often a new opportunity to me was like, yes, I'm ready for the next thing. Even though, you know, there's a patience factor that needs to go into growth, you know, um, but I, I definitely was ready. So I accepted the position. I, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. I just knew that the next the next step was there. Uh, and and when I got hired at uh, Bank of America, I, I got blessed and privy to a lot of information about the surrounding. I just so happily my area of focus was the Pennsylvania region. So um, even though I had the entire Pennsylvania region, I was only, I mean, region, I was only curious about Philadelphia because right. this is where I'm from. Yeah, of course. I'm like, I want to see this data. I want to yeah. see this. I, this, is, this is new. So I got the information. Um, and as I started looking at like data, I'm like, wow, why are so many uh, uh, minority and low income communities struggling with their credit? What is the issue? Is it really just credit? Or is it like, is it them not having access to the information, um, the education or the resources to uh, overstep that that wall like that they, they constantly face? My job was to take the all of the decline applicants and put them into demographics and ratios depending on location. So if you lived in Erie, Pennsylvania, I would take the decline ratios in Erie, Pennsylvania and construct how many decline to approve applicants were in that area. Um, and this would give um, the branches knowledge to understand what targeted customers to go after for loans or, or you know, housing, um, housing loans or whatever the, 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 the loan product they were looking to do. This, this back end work allowed them to uh, do their jobs more effectively. So how did you feel when you were seeing this data? I figured out what my God-given purpose was, right? And I know a lot of us on, you know, on planet Earth, we, we're all trying to figure out what, are, what am I here for? What am I designed to do? And you know, we go back and forth with that analysis by paralysis all the time. But at that moment at Bank of America, I was like, this is what I need to do. They have educated me here. They have trained me. They have certified me. Why not use these skills to go and give back? So at that moment, I said, but before I do that, I could change the game in Bank of America first. Let me go and show the executives that we should create a program to help all the client applicants across the country. They said, no, wasn't profitable for them. I said, wow, you know, my values don't line up with this organization anymore. I, I, I got to go. So I left. I sat down with my best friend one day and I just told her, I said, yo, I got this crazy idea and you won't believe it. She was like, what? I said, I want to start a nonprofit. She said, a nonprofit? Do you know what that, like, do, do, what is it? What, what are we doing? I know it's not for profit, but what are the, you know, what is all of the, uh, the jargon behind it? What is all the information that we need to know in order for this to be successful? I said, you know what? I don't know, but I just got to do it. So you wanted to create a nonprofit to help all those folks who were getting declined and couldn't get past that wall. Exactly. And so... What was your first move? How do you even start that? Did you feel overwhelmed? <laughs> I, I, I did because I didn't know. After leaving Bank of America, I, I said I still needed cash flow, right? I need, still needed money for my own personal life. So I, I started real estate school and I got my realtor's license. And I started the program originally to educate homeowners, to create more homeowners in the community. So in addition to you getting your credit together, now I'm going to give you an asset or, or, or a voice because... If you don't have ownership in this country, you, you don't have a voice. You're just the invisible class as to what they call it now. So I said, okay, I need to create homeowners in, the, in addition to the credit piece, right? So I said, I'm going to just create a, uh, this is going to be like a uh, first time home buyer, you know, organization. And I didn't feel full. I, I had one, uh, one workshop series. So we have uh, a workshop series four times a year, once per quarter, but it's for a six week stretch. So we had one workshop series over a six week period and I just didn't feel it. I was doing enough. I said, no. So you, you didn't think that, can you elaborate on that? Why not? Because I, I felt like my desire was not to be a realtor. My desire was to be an educator. So I figured out at that moment, I said, no, this isn't it because I feel like I'm just, I'm educating people just for this sole purpose. Why not just educate people to 
uh, show my philanthropic ways for them to educate their household. Because literally, if I teach one person in every household in the city, they can teach the rest of their household. And then we can change this epidemic as a whole. So that's why I didn't feel full. I didn't feel satisfied. I said, no, this isn't, I'm not satisfied. I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm not doing enough. So I, I sat down with the team again. And I told them, I said, listen, I'm going to change this from a first-time homebuyer program to a nonprofit that just focuses on financial literacy. And it was at that moment, as I as I made that 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 change, God blessed me with everything that I was calling upon. I was like, I, I need this. And it was just like, oh, I met this person at this event and they were on board. And I'm like, yes. You know, and I was just I, I was in that place of like, now that I, now, you know, we we all are down here and equipped with, you know, certain skill sets um, and, and just certain uh, ways about us that gives us the direction to to go towards that 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 thing that we're looking for and for me i knew once i switched it to financial education and then i started receiving a lot of blessings behind it, i knew that that was my that you was my feel, calling you could feel the momentum i could feel i could feel the momentum switching because it, it just made sense you know um and when i made that switch I, I literally started receiving phone calls from a lot of people asking me to do workshops asking me to come out to this event and be a keynote speaker i'm in um, rooms with people discussing economic development, I literally started changing the game uh, in my own head because I, I never, I was never exposed to this. So that was like really inspiring for me to, you know, uh, to have that aha moment, you know? Um, and I thought being a realtor was it because I'm like, oh, I can get profit. I can, you know, I can uh, educate and put more, um, put more people into, into homes and, and, and make a living for myself out of it and teach. But I said, nah, it's not about that. It's about just educating. Now, the nonprofit is called the People's Innovation Movement. Yes. Where does that name come from? Because it doesn't say anything about financial literacy in the title. Nah, it doesn't. So what does it mean? The People's Innovation Movement means an organization for the people, by the people. I'm just another person on this planet, right? And we pride ourselves on feedback from the community. So it's an organization that's essentially run by the very people that we serve because what their interests are is what we want to educate on. You know, we don't want to stand up in front of a room and teach them things that, they, that that's not applicable to their life. And it's a movement. For me, dating back to the Freedmen's Bureau of, you know, the, uh, after the proclamation um, and emancipation of 1865 with Abe Lincoln, it was all, it was a movement. It was a civil rights movement. It was a, now, and now I call it a silver rights yeah, movement. Yeah, so I saw that in a recent Instagram post for the People's Innovation yes. Movement. What is silver rights? Civil rights is just another name for the next era of the civil rights movement, right? So civil rights movement has a lot of negative condensation, you know, going back to how it all evolved back in history. But now being in this new phase of, of movement and marching towards equal rights for everyone, um, the word silver just... It, it just it just exemplifies something um, positive in a way. Um, so when, when I used it, I, I I said, and I got a lot of back. Actually, that you you know mentioned that people were DMing me like, "Yo, you it's silver, it's civil." I civil, saw the civil. comments. Yeah. So I had to go back and and edit the the caption and put the pun is intentional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because I wanted <laughs> people to know that this was the next stage. Right. And actually, um, that you mentioned that I. That day, I actually got to speak at uh, bef before a city council and the mayor's office um, after receiving a resolution, and I said it, and then everyone, all of the city councilmen and women were looking up like, "Did he say silver? Oh, this is this is you know this is this is dope. Yes, we're in the next phase, and I and I kind of use that word just to indicate the next era of w what we're fighting for in this silver rights because we all deserve equal opportunities." whether it's to housing, entrepreneurship opportunities, uh, it, it just equal rights all across the playing field. So, yeah, tell me about when you received the resolution from city council. So you received a resolution that every third week in October mm -hmm. will be Philadelphia Financial Literacy Week. Yes. How did you feel when that resolution got passed? As I, when I went to the podium, I said, you know, this is the beginning of a new ever here in the city. I said, it's about connecting. And I turned around and I have the video on my phone. I turned around, looked at all, everyone, all the policymakers. I said, it's about all of you, poli all of the policymakers in this room, right? Fighting this cause with me and other financial mavens in the city. It's not, a, it's not just about me, but it's the beginning of a new era here because if we really want change, we have to change 
the way we offer these type of resources and opportunities to the community. And and again, you know, um, going back to me spending that dollar that I got every day at that coffee shop every day without knowing that that was my ticket to building something for my future, whether it was putting it into a savings account or starting a small business for me at the age of nine, which a lot of kids are doing now. And it's so inspiring because I did not think or had that type of frame of mind at that age. But, you know, standing up there, I, I reflected back on that dollar moment. You know, I was like, wow. I'm a kid that went from getting a dollar every day from a guy in a coffee shop to standing in front of politicians who make a lot of decisions here in the city, receiving a resolution uh, for a week that means so much more to me than this resolution because it's the beginning of a new chapter for us. Um, and I feel like, you know, I, I just want to make an impact. And, and, and in the meetings, in my committee meetings leading up to that moment, I told them, I said, listen, what we're doing it's not about anyone in this room, right? We're starting something here. And if you're on board, you're because I'm, I'm a very uh, intentional guy, right? So I, I said, you, you're, either, you're either on board or you're not on board. But I'm going to still be at the top of Broad and Cease to Be More because our office is at 6 and Cease to Be More. So I'm at the top of Broad and Cease to Be More with the torch by myself, leading something for this new generation of humans, you know, because we're, we're in a new phase. And I, I really think that it was really important for that to happen and i mean for me i i felt slightly accomplished but in that moment again i just reflected back it yeah. wasn't even a yeah. like yes i made it moment it was a oh this is a new beginning um and i'm just getting started coming up we'll hear about the ups and downs nasir has experienced in building this movement and we'll also talk about the steps we all can take to make the dollars we earn work for us Everyone, I am so excited to announce that Philly Who's first ever live episode will take place on December 6th, featuring venture capitalist and startup founder Josh Koppelman. Josh is the founder of First Round Capital, a seed stage venture capital firm that is headquartered here in Philly and has backed companies such as Warby Parker, Square, and Uber. Before First Round, Josh attended Wharton at Penn and then started three companies, including Half.com, which was later acquired by eBay. Josh will be telling us his Philly story as a part of Founder Factory, Philly startup leaders' one-day conference for Philly entrepreneurs, startup employees, and students, among others. To get tickets to the conference, head to podphillywho.com forward slash factory and use promo code phillywho2018 to get 10% off admission to the conference. And be sure to let me know if you're coming on social at podphillywho. And when you're there, come say hello. Once again, head to podphillywho.com forward slash factory to get tickets. I'll see you there. Welcome back to Philly Who with Nasir Smith. Now, as Nasir has spread the word about the people's innovation movement, he's discovered that one thing that stops everyday people from taking control of their finances is the fact that people in financial services often take advantage of them or completely ignore them. So understandably, when many people hear of a completely free class about handling their wealth, they think it's too good to be true. I actually had a woman and a husband come during Philly Financial Literacy Week. They had been blown over by so many lenders um, and, and their realtor didn't really, they, he lacked the attentiveness that they needed, you know, throughout this duration. Because after all, I mean, they're trying to be homeowners. So they big. were looking for a home. Yeah. And it came through to the home ownership workshop and they didn't trust nobody. They were like, they were bad. They were like badly beaten because when they came, they were very, very, um, I want to use the word negative, but they were very uh, skeptical. Yeah, they were very skeptical about, you know, what it is that we were doing. They came because oh, they were interested. Really? And they were like, well, what are you guys doing? Why, why are you doing this? What, what do you guys get out of this? And I'm like, ma'am, sir, this is us giving back. We don't get paid for this. This is free. Um, and, I, and, the, and the workshops are free to come to. So what's actually funny, she, we got edu- uh, the, the lender that was there who was a, you know, also a partner with my organization. He works for Fulton Bank. He gave them um, game, right? guidance attention motivation and education right so he gave them the game and they bought into it and long behold the next tuesday 
they were pre-approved for a mortgage through Julius. And Julius was laughing because the same people who came in battered and, 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 and furious about their previous experiences left with some hope and some optimism because they felt as though that they had the right people and that they had been surrounded with, with the type of attention that they needed to make this process um, smooth, run smoothly for them. So that was one story. Um, we also had a, a, a young lady uh, in our first ever workshop series who came to every workshop and she wanted to get a duplex. She got educated. She came to every workshop and she ended up getting a pre-approval for a, a duplex and, and moved into a property and was able to rent it out. And she had a baby. And now she has a, a an asset that she's able to leave to the child for them to now create a legacy and that generational wealth that we all aspire to, you know, have and, and, and it's, it's a deep desire to have, you know? So that's so inspiring to hear those stories. For me, it is too. I, in, in it, you know, I'm like, I want to plan for the future, but I want to live in this moment. I got to live in this moment of, of, of appreciating and, and fully allowing the work that I'm doing to relish, right? Because I'm a planner. Like, I'll, I'll, I'll plan blueprints until 2020. But living in this, this moment right now, and impacting lives and, and making people homeowners and, and, and helping people achieve financial success is so, so valuable to me that, you know, now I'm at colleges talking to um, other scholars about the importance of investing and, 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 and making sure that the credit is, is established while they're in school um, so that they're ahead of the game when they get out. Um, talking to them about home ownership and, and that piece and, and, Really uh, looking at life insurance as well as a, as, a, as a wealth builder. So we, you know, that's something I've been recently introduced to um, actually at TU. Oh, yeah? Um, Go else. <laughs> <laughs> um, and at, at Drexel, um, I was able to educate um, some, some scholars there as well. Yeah. So you, now you're still in college. I am. Right? <laughs> so <I am>. now, <laughs> that's crazy, man. So you have already launched a successful nonprofit that has already made impact made an impact on countless lives and you've got five years experience in the financial industry so why are you still in college <laughs> for further achievements i i, I want to get certified as a financial planner um and it requires a degree so i'm kind of doing it to, to to get to the thing that i'm looking for um i often go on time and, and with debate with my girlfriend all the time because she's she graduated from penn state with her pr degree and she's working in the financial industries which is absurd um, and when I first met her, she knew nothing about nothing about like credit, money management. She knew, you know, the basics, but she didn't know enough. Um, and then that that transpired. We often go back and forth about like the college thing. And, you know, we can go back and forth about the importance of it if it's, if it's not important. But for me, I, I, I see it as a it's my tool. It's my it's the tool that I need to get to that next level um, for my development um, and education up across the board is important, no matter what you're educating. So I don't care if it's college, trade school, um, you're paying for um, seminars or whatever. You need to invest in yourself. Um, and I think college is essentially investing in yourself uh, to get you to that next level. Um, so I definitely um, am using this experience as a way to show myself that you have to use different things in life as a tool to get to that yeah, next level. just like that dollar in the coffee Just like shop. the dollar from the, from the coffee shop. When we exchanged emails before getting together, you had mentioned that there were uh, a couple of tough moments that yes. where you know you maybe even thought about quitting. Can you tell me about one of those moments? Right at the process of when I wasn't feeling full about this about this this organization that I started, I was like, uh, "This isn't it, Tay." Her name, my, my best friend's name is Shantae. So I said, "Nah, Tay, this isn't it. I I don't feel it." You know what? Let's just forget that we started this. I'll, I'll go back to being just full time in financial services, and I'll figure it out later. And it was because I was feeling, I was, I was doubting myself. Um, I didn't want to, I didn't want to tackle the challenge. I, I felt unmotivated because I, I felt like I finally started something, and now I'm, I'm, I'm about to let it go because I don't, I don't feel like it's in the right place or it's not where I want it to be. You know, oftentimes we're always in a place of like, if something is not where we want to be, we just like, you know what, forget it. It's not working out. So I was in that moment. I was like, eh. You know, I'll sleep on it on the weekend, but, you know, as of right now, we're done. So that next month, I actually, I, I don't know, I was, I was sitting on my bed one day and, and I was just listening to um, Eric Thomas, you know, E.T., the hip-hop preacher. 
and he was talking about um how bad do you want to succeed right we, we all know that mantra it's kind of like a uh i don't know that's his slogan now how bad do you want to succeed if you want to succeed as bad as you want to breathe then you'll be successful right so i was listening to that mantra because i needed to hear that again and i was like wow if i really want this thing right or if i really want to chase success and i come across my first hurdle of not knowing how to get past it or or, or, or get it uh switched to the way i want it then then why why chase success why not just say forget success i'll just live life the way it comes to me every day and i say you know this i didn't come this far I, I didn't sit down and start something after being so passionate about coming from a bank that didn't even want to honor this to just give it up i said no way um so i called shante again and i said shante i i i, I, I got it i figured it out and that's when I told her what the next phase of what I wanted to do about going into just educating individuals instead of making it a first time home buyer organization. And she said, you know what? I like that better because you were already doing it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, you know what? It makes way more sense. It makes way more sense. I said, you're right. And, and, and instead of telling my, and instead of advertising myself, because I had to rebrand myself because everybody knew me as Nas the Realtor. And that was actually my name on Instagram as Nas the Realtor. And I was sitting on my, I was like, oh, this isn't me. Real, being a realtor isn't me. I love real estate, right? But being a realtor wasn't me, right? So I felt like, uh, nah. So I put my real estate license in escrow. And then I started this new path of rebranding who Nasir was and what he was going to represent. And then I had to do a lot of, because people are taking so much from me, I had to do a lot of, uh, I, I had to talk less and read more and figure out this new this new Nasir, right? Because that old Nasir was all about real estate. Yeah, I'm the realtor. I'm going to get people homes and I'm, I'm going to educate people in the process. And I just, you know, I didn't feel full. And, you know, I, I feel like uh, I needed that moment of like wanting to give up yeah. to kind of have that slap in the face. Right, that to perspective. To say, no, Nasir, you just have to rebrand yourself. And I literally rebranded everything about myself to now just being, uh, you know, a financial education advocate i call myself an advocate as well because yes i'm a financial educator but i'm also an advocate for it because if someone else has the credentials to also teach financial education more power to them because it takes a village not just one person to get uh, a movement uh, across so yeah that definitely uh was that moment That's good for me. stuff man uh so i have a couple of questions that i ask every guest just to get different perspectives what would you say is a common misconception about you that i'm perfect <laughs> 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 well, you had me fooled. <laughs> <laughs> Most people think that, you know, because Instagram is a highlight reel, we all post our highlights on there. I'm never going to post a moment when I was sitting on my side of my bed, getting ready to give up TPIM. I, I didn't post that. I posted the moment that I rebranded myself and now this is what it's, what it's going to be. Yeah. So a lot of people will say, well, how do you manage your time? How do you, how do you, how are you a full-time student and, and you work and you run a nonprofit and you have a girlfriend? How are you doing these things? The truth is, I'm, I, I, I plan, I plan my work and I work the plan. I mean, if it doesn't fit in my daily schedule, it just doesn't get done. I mean, that's kind of how I have to live. And that makes me um, not feel anxious or overwhelmed, you know, because um, oftentimes I used to run into this problem where um, I will overpromise and underdeliver, and then I will feel like I'm, I'm committing to too many things. And then I had to condense that. And then I, I, I put myself in this, in this moment where if it ain't on the calendar, it ain't happening. You know, so I live by a calendar. Did you did you find it difficult to start to decline and say no to things? I still struggle with that right now. People will call me or text me or email me about something. And my girlfriend's a constant reminder for me to, to say, you know, no, that you can't do something. Because I'll, I'll say yes. And then I'll literally go from, I'll have something set up from one, two, three, four, trying to make it all work. And I'm like running in traffic or I'm trying to get to the next place. One place could be in South Philly and I'm going to, you know, Northeast. So it, um, I still find it difficult because I want to be there for everybody, right? If someone's asking me to come do a presentation, I don't want to tell them no, because this is my purpose. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, that's tough. I mean, I yeah. feel that. Like, so I'm in a place now where I've got a couple of businesses being launched. I've got, uh, you know, I'm involved in a singing club and and just so much other stuff. And it's, I want to do everything. <laughs> so I, I just, I think the biggest challenge in me since becoming a full-time entrepreneur earlier this year has been that, right? Like once your time is free to fill with what you want, if you want more than what you can fill your time with, how do you choose? How do you say no to people? How do you, you know, maintain relationships? Cause I just feel so bad. I feel like I everyone's going to hate me. I, I do. Cause I feel like 
then two, the person feels like, you're, I feel like I'm letting them down. Not the person feels like, but I feel like I'm letting them down. Yeah, exactly. And I, I had to come to come to terms with myself to say, you know what, Nasir? Your purpose is to educate. You will be in every room that you need to be in um, that will allow for success to manifest in your life. So the rooms that you can't get into means that that room is not for you. Meaning that room may be for someone else to, to take on. Or maybe I won't be able to get to it this week or this month. I'll be able to get to it in the following months. So I try to, one of the things I do too, because I'm, I don't want to let them down. They're asking for a weekend date and I know I have something to do. I'll try to my best to like get them to schedule it, um, for an evening time during the week, or I'll try to get them to, I'll try to get them to work with my schedule more so of me working with their schedule. So that way it works. Yeah. You know, so it can actually happen. Right. Right. Yeah. Gotcha. So if you could send a message to yourself at any point in the past, what would you say? Take that dollar and start a business. (laughs) Uh, that dollar, that dollar, uh, analogy and story that I gave in the beginning was, uh, true to me because I didn't understand what he was doing, but he was showing me a skill that was setting me up for the future. And it kind of like, it, you know, you have, you ever watched that so Raven and she has that moment and she's like going into her eye yeah, looking yeah. back and, and I, you know, for me, that's the moment I'm having now. It's like, wow, that dollar needs to be invested literally like yeah one dollar can't make you rich we know that but that one dollar saved or that one dollar invested is another dollar earned you know so that's what i would say to myself um to nasir then it sounds like that's what you're saying to everyone now (laughs) yes yes take that dollar and 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 if if you have ten dollars reinvest five save two and spend three that's the model so this is for everybody that is trying to train a mindset, right? This is perspective here. To be broke is economic. To be poor is a disabling frame of mind and a depressed condition of your spirit. And you must vow to never be poor again because poor is a mentality. Broke, yeah, you can be broke physically, but you're never poor because you are you have a purpose. You have a divine uh, uh, skill set of why you're put on this earth. And once you tap into that moment, you'll realize that you're way more richer than you look poor when you were possibly sitting down thinking like, I'm I'm just another poor person, you know? So that quote like sticks with me and and I have to give credits to John O'Brien for that. Who's He's an inspiration for me big time. He runs Operation Hope, financial uh, literacy um, uh, organization all along the East Coast and West Coast. And he started this organization back in uh, 1994 and he talked about relationship capital and 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 uh, the free um, economic uh, system that we live in, and 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 tapping into your potential. And it's a book called um, uh, The Memo. Uh, most of us haven't gotten the memo, which is why we're still living like that. From your perspective in the financial world, and I think we probably have talked about this, but what's the biggest challenge facing Philadelphia? Just getting people people to believe that they can accomplish uh, financial success, because they we're, we're so we're so behind. Um, when it comes to financial education, that people need that that sense of hope or 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 that 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 opportunity to feel like they're they can go from sleeping on their their aunt's couch to owning a mansion or or or, or working at McDonald's to now running a, a Fortune 500 company. It can happen, but it starts with you and how you envision your life. So that's one of the things I always do with um, kids when I'm teaching a financial lesson. Um, I try not to give them, try to talk too much because their attention span is, 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 is really short. So I try to give them, get them to create a financial vision board of how they see their life later in life financially. So I want, I, if, you, if you see yourself having a house, draw it. If you see yourself owning a car, draw it. If you see yourself owning a business, illustrate it. Like, give them perspective visually because I think as humans, we, we oftentimes, when we see something visually, we, we come to terms of understanding it better than actually seeing it like written down as a goal. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. So, and I have one of those in my house and it's actually inspiring for me to keep looking at it to, to give myself perspective. Yeah, yeah. On the flip side, what is the most encouraging thing you think about Philadelphia? We're grinders. Mm. We grind it out. Um, we, as millennials, for, for one, are people who are intentionally disrupting the status quo of what life used to be and how things used to, you know, work. And we're go-getters. We're taking risks. We're, we're leaving jobs. We're, we're, we're starting our own businesses. We are really tapping into our potential 
and we are going after the things that we believe in. And I, I think for me, that's inspiring to see people all over do things to to better their future because they see more for themselves than where they currently are. That's what's I think so exciting about it is is how it cascades, right? Yes. You know, by by you taking this leap and leaving the financial industry, which would have been probably very comfortable, you have devoted your life to helping others get to that place. Right. And and other people see you do that and then they're gonna do it too. And then they'll be seen and then they'll be seen and, and it's just this this beautiful wave of yes. inspiration. Finally, if you could get one message to every Philadelphian, whether a tweet, an email, a billboard, something written in the sky, whatever, every Philadelphian could read it and ponder it, what would you say? Education is key, and the interest on it is compounded daily. Mm. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) All right. (laughs) I'll leave it at that. For more on Nasir, the People's Innovation Movement, and Philly Financial Education Week, you can head to podphillywho.com forward slash T-P-I-M. Or you can just check out the links in the show notes. As always, if you like the show, be sure to subscribe and give us a rating if you're on Apple Podcasts. You can also follow along on Twitter and Instagram at podphillywho. Philly Who is a Q9 production with editing by Max Graham, Podcast artwork by Lauren Carhart and music by Lee Rosevier. Special thanks to Nasir for being on the show. For Philly Who, my name is Kevin Schmidlin. See you next week. <laughs> <laughs>